with co-host Jay. We got another great, exciting episode in the loins of history where we're going to connect the history of the past to current events of today. We're going to continue on our series about the history of Chinese and U.S. relations. And if you remember last week, we were talking about the beginning of the Chinese Civil War with the fracture and conflict between the CCP and the KMT, starting with the Shanghai Massacre and ending with the the Long March. And today we're going to pick it up actually in the second Sino-Japanese War beginning in 1937. So with that being said, we got a lot to talk about. It's going to be a really, really interesting episode. Jay, what are some of the key takeaways we have? Awesome. Thanks, Colin. (laughs) Uh, We have three key takeaways uh, this episode. Number one, the second Sino-Japanese War, uh, and for our American friends, that's part of World War II, (laughs) the second Sino-Japanese War. Thank you for clarifying that. I felt like when I was reading off the notes like this, people are going to be like, wait, hold on. There's What war was this? That's almost World War II. I love love self-deprecating humor. Uh, we love America. All right. The Second <laughs> Japanese War was a major turning point in the history of U.S. Chinese relations because it was the first time that the United States had made uh, significant steps to actually enforce the open door policy. Um, prior to that, the open door policy was just kind of on paper. Number two, the U.S. effectively ended its relationship with Japan and eventually went to war with Japan in order to enforce the open door policy. Uh, We'll we'll, kind of explain how Americans kind of just see the U.S. and Japan on this collision course independent of China, when in fact... If there wasn't conflict between Japan and China, there would not have been conflict between the U.S. and Japan, and we'll talk about that. And then number three, uh, Japanese war atrocities uh, that began during this time still have an impact on Asian relations between Japan, Korea, and China uh, and elsewhere. Uh, still have impact on on relations, and the U.S. still has to navigate those uh, touchy subjects today. Uh, it's still like very much an issue; cannot be overstated. Jay, can you? Uh, so, you know, I, last week we ended with the the ending of the Long March and kind of where things stood in 1936. But I think for this week's episode, we kind of got to go back to the Manchurian crisis and Japanese aggression. I think I mentioned it in 1931 with Japan invading Manchuria, but do you want to start with us there? Because I think that's kind of sets the stage for this second side of Japanese war. Yeah. Let's, let's paint the picture. I think I've talked about before. I, visual person have to see like the map in my mind <laughs> to understand what's what's going on right um so in ni- so there were two different um major crises in the 30s uh that that kind of got the map to where it was in 1937 when the second sino-japanese war kicked off the first one was in 1931 so you had the imperial japanese army Hanging out in Korea, um, hanging out in the Liaodong Peninsula um, with designs on Manchuria. Japan already had extensive economic interests in Manchuria. They were operating lots of different railways. Uh, You know, they were protect. These railways were facilitating Japanese, uh, well, intra-Japanese Manchurian slash Chinese. trade and they were protecting these railroads well one of the favorite things that the japanese army at that time the imperial japanese army liked to do was kind of manufacture these incidents or these crises and they would do it i mean they did it over and over and over and over again for like 50 years uh in this area and then something would happen and they would go oh we're just we gotta invade we gotta take over Um, The Russians would do the same thing, by the way. So this happened in 1931, where uh, this crisis occurred over over a railroad and the Japanese invade. Well, they don't like annex all of what's um, uh, 
known as Manchuria, but rather they established a puppet government. We talked about this a little bit in our last episode, but they set up the last emperor of the Qing dynasty, a guy named Pu Yi, who, oh, yeah. who at this I time remember. had become an adult. And they set up the puppet state of Manchukuo. There was like this declaration of Manchurian independence from uh, from the KMT and uh, from from China on the whole. Uh, and the Japanese were like, look at what we're doing. You know, and they're couching it in terms that were po- national self-determination. These people want to be independent. Blah, blah, which was blah, blah. A, which is a very if you remember, we talked about this when I think when we went over the history of political parties, when we started discussing like Woodrow Wilson, like this is a big push, like self, the idea of self-determination was very popular with Woodrow Wilson post-World War One. kind of, hey, we're going to, we've had this, these empires that are now breaking apart and people are allowed to self-determine. So they were just using popular uh, political speak, if you will, I think when you say that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe one day we'll, uh, we'll do a series on just Japan. Uh, because, uh, it's, it's fascinating to see like why Japan was doing the things that they were doing during this time. Uh, because I I was, you know, in doing research for this episode, seeing Westerners claim like, Oh, Japan wanted, like they saw great Britain and French empires and they wanted an empire too. And I just, I don't, maybe not disagree, but just try to qualify those statements a little bit and say like there's no way a you know eastern culture wants this this western style imperial like ideas like they're not coming at they never had this common background of the roman empire japan never didn't have um uh like a a humongous sprawling in, or empire that they were trying to reclaim, which is true for Europe. Uh, a lot of the European empires, uh, in at different times and in different places, were claiming uh, some type of historical continuity with the Roman Empire. Literally every uh, one of them. When we talked about Russia, Tsar I means Caesar, Reich, basically the third Rome, Moscow is the third Rome. Everybody has an eagle. Look, look in Washington D.C. at our architecture. It's extremely Roman in nature. That right. We're all Westerners. All go back to Rome. So yeah, Japan. Great point. Yeah, Japan didn't have that. So it wasn't. It's not as simple as oh, Japan just wanted an empire. I. I mean, I'm I'm not a, a Japanese scholar, but you know, Jay's two cents is that <clears throat> it probably has something. It has something to do with these imperial Japanese generals. They're, they they harken back to the period of the samurai and uh, the daimyos, w- which dominated. Like that was around in Japan for a long time. These independent warlords who would go and kind of just spread their influence wherever. And these these generals, that's kind of who they saw themselves as. So if you're a general hanging out in southern Manchuria and Korea, you think of yourself as like an independent daimyo. They're not they're not trying to expand like Japan per se, as much as they're just trying to like get glory for themselves. I don't yeah. know. That, that does make sense. I digress. <laughs> Jay, you know, I had Getting another, way off topic here. <laughs> I don't want to go. I'm going to get a, off topic again, but kind of on topic a little mm. bit. I don't know. We're going to go a different direction. While you're talking about this crisis, it kind of dawned on me. Like if we're going to take an example of this in modern day, it almost looks mm-hmm. like the Russia. This is kind of like Russia Crimea in 2014, where it's sort of like, hey, we're just going to we are going to claim this as Russia. We're going to annex it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously we see this. So this happened in 1931. What, six years later, they invade completely. It's kind of like with yeah. Russia. It's like, well, they annexed Crimea. They just stacked up troops on the border. They obviously had interest in the Donbass region. They sort of had these little proxy campaigns going on. It was almost like everyone should have known that they were going to invade Shortly yeah. thereafter, it, it just kind of it, these look very, very similar in that the U.S. in 1931 really didn't have a historical context to look at and say, hey, we know this means that there's an invasion coming, uh, but they should yeah. have. At least in now we can look and say, well, yeah, the Russians were obviously going to invade Ukraine. 
right. as a matter of time. No, you're no, you're right. The uh, I thought I thought at first I was going to disagree with you. It's <laughs> say like uh, yeah, it's say you know when Russia invaded Crimea in 2014, Crimea for for a really long time was in fact part of Russia. Um, and when they took it from uh, the the Tartars and the in the Crimean Khanate, uh, like several hundred years ago, as opposed to Manchuria, which was never Japanese, there's hard there's like no cultural <laughs> linguistic continuity with Japan. So it's like it was different. However, what what I think you were saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but. Yes, like 1931 and 1935, which what happened in 1935 was Japan continued to take more territory. And actually, they created another puppet state um, called Menguko or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they actually annexed some territory right next to Beijing. So they further expanded their Manchurian possessions even beyond Manchuko, which is what uh, the... Puyi and the and that puppet government controlled. Uh and yeah, to your point, it, it's like, come on, guys, like this has got it's if Japan doesn't learn it doesn't learn its lesson, it's not going to stop. In the same way that when Russia took over Crimea in 2014, like it just essentially received a slap on the wrist. It's not going to stop. That was the point I was trying to make. Obviously, right. there's different cultural reasons, but but yeah, and you know, I I guess I had never really put this together until I was researching this. And I was, I just typed in, I was like, Manchurian candidate, like, where does that, it's just a, it's basically a, a puppet political leader. People have probably seen the movie or read the book, but like, that's, that's after Pu Yi and the Manchukuo dynasty. I did, the Manchurian I did not candidate. know that. You know, I just, I just put the, I was like, huh, Manchurian candidate. It's like, oh yeah, it's a puppet political leader. Oh, that was that was exactly what Pu Yi was. He was just propped up by the Japanese, and I was like, "Oh, it makes sense now that those two things are connected." Yeah, I I, I didn't know that about the Manchurian candidate, but it makes a lot of sense. So, just to kind of real quick to continue setting the stage. So, after 1935, the Japanese control um, all of Manchuria through Manchukuo, and they're like on the on the border of Beijing province, not necessarily, you know, at the gates of the city itself, but they're really close. They're also in like Northern China, right on the border of, of Shangxi uh, province. This is, that all happened in 1935. The United States up until that point had not done like any real punitive measures. There have been a lot of diplomatic Naughty, naughty, Japan, you know, don't do that. This isn't in our interest. However, America was also couching its condemning rhetoric still in protecting only American interest terms. So America also was still had growing business enterprise in China and in Japan. And we were also still very concerned about our missionaries. We had a lot of missionaries still in northern China and elsewhere. And we wanted to make sure the Japanese and all these conflicts weren't, you know, harming the actual U.S. persons, either either businessmen or missionaries. Uh, And we wanted to protect their freedom to go do that. And we didn't want the Japanese uh, to get involved. Uh, or sorry, we didn't want the Japanese to harm them. So that's kind of where we were at in 1935. Japan's still growing, but there's not really any serious mechanisms, at least from the United States, uh, to ensure that Japan doesn't keep expanding. The lesson that Japan is learning in 1935 is we, the cons of damaging our relationship with the United States is still worth further expansion into China. And that brings us to 1937 uh, and the Marco Polo Bridge incident. All right. So Marco Polo Bridge incident. This is, you know, we were just talking about Japanese manufactured crises. And uh, there's this river outside of Beijing in 1937. And a bridge. It is exactly how it sounds. The Marco Polo Bridge. <laughs> and 
there was these skirmishes uh, were started between Japanese and Chinese soldiers. Can't say definitively who started it. Um, you know, most most people kind of assume it was the Japanese only because they have a history of trying to start stuff. So after the skirmish starts, the Japanese, uh, the Imperial Japanese Army just goes off on a full-blown assault. And they end up very quickly taking, they take the city of Beijing and they take the major port city um, uh, of uh Tian, Tianjin, Tianjin, uh, really, really to the southeast of Beijing. For our listeners, remember our Boxer Rebellion episode. Tianjin is where the Seymour expedition like came in. That's where all the uh, the uh, the eight nations were like bringing in their troops. So it's like right there next to next to Beijing. This incident and this like huge battle that ensues, where Japan basically takes over all of Beijing province sparks a, a big international uh, outcry. And this is when the U.S. kind of goes, okay, this is the beginning of the the Second Sino-Japanese War. We start seeing some sanctions, uh, some minor stuff on like particular Japanese individuals and businesses. The Japanese had already left the League of Nations, uh, and it's not like the U.S. was a part of that anyway. So, like the League of Nations couldn't really do very, uh, very much, and this this kind of ended the Le- both the League of Nations because uh, people completely lost confidence that that could do anything. It also ended if you if if we listen or if we remember our last episode or uh, two episodes ago, the 1922 Nine Power Treaty. Uh, that was the treaty where Japan. Was, was one of the nine powers that affirmed the open door policy. And uh, early letters from the U.S. Secretary of State in 1937 was like, yo, you guys need to pull out of Japan, go back to the 1937 borders, and reaffirm the nine power treaty. And Japan just didn't respond. So this is the end of the nine power uh, treaty. This is the end of the League of Nations and now we have the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War. I think it's kind of interesting. So with the start of the Second um, Sino-Japanese War, to look at the relations between the CCP and the KMT at this point, like we, we kind of left off right here last week. And if you remember, after the Long March, the CCP moved kind of north and west and occupied very rural areas, uh, but large landmass, but very rural. And the KMT occupied mostly like cities in around like Beijing, Nanjing, places like that. Um, Chiang Kai-shek had a very um, anti-CCP stance. And up until this point, he actually focused almost all his energy against the CCP instead of the Japanese. Um, Hmm. He, I think there's some differing reports, but a lot of people believe that he didn't think that um, the Japanese or excuse me, the Chinese could stop the Japanese, like the KMT by itself. So he wanted to eliminate the CCP. And then that was his idea for unification was eliminate the CCP, bring them back into the fold of the nationalist Chinese, then fight the Japanese. Um, There was actually an incident where, um, his, some of his generals who were super disgruntled because they saw, and this is uh, before the actual Sino-Japanese war broke out, but they actually saw the Japanese as this massive threat. And they're like, hey, you have to become a lot allied with the CCP in order for us to stop the Japanese. They're the bigger threat. And a lot hmm. of the Chinese people believe the same thing. They're like, they were more concerned about the Japanese coming in versus the CCP. So um, uh, Zhang Zhuliang, I, I think I pronounced that correctly. And Yang Hu Cheng um, were super, they were two of his top generals in the KMT. They actually kidnapped him for like two weeks and essentially hmm. forced him into this kind of name only treaty with the CCP. Um, and in that name only alliance, it was called the second United front where they would um, stop their fighting and create this allied front against the Japanese <clears throat> And it's important to note that the KMT, because if you remember, Chiang Kai-shek was a, he was born and raised 
really in the, well, he was raised throughout the military and even studied in Japan. So he was a hard military man and he was going to use conventional tactics. And we'll see how that works out for him against the Japanese. Whereas Mao and the Red Army and the CCP, they wanted to use guerrilla tactics and they were mm-hmm. highly, well, more effective. I shouldn't say highly effective, said more yeah. effective in fighting the Japanese, but it actually won them a lot of popular support um, amongst the people because it, they were perceived as being more effective. So more people started favoring the CCP. So just to put that out there, that there is the second United Front between the KMT and the CCP. It is mostly a name only because they actually did still kind of harass each other and fight. Um, there's yep. numerous instances of the KMT forcing the CCP to to move to certain places to fight the Japanese and they would actually attack them and vice versa. So um, it's not like this was a hunky dory. We're going to put our, put our differences aside. It was, yeah. we hate each other and we're going to fight the Japanese and each other kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's still very much this competition over the hearts and minds of the Chinese people themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Colin, you talked about the mandate of heaven in one of our earlier episodes, like all these different warlords, Mao for the CCP, Chiang Kai-shek, they are, they're still competing for this mandate of heaven for leg- legitimacy. So they had to put on this external front of like, oh, you know, we're all friends. We're fighting off the Japanese. And then they're like killing each other on the sides type deal because <laughs> they're in competition with one another. So yeah. So when the Jap- when the Japanese invade in 1937, there's not, it's a, Yes, there's somewhat of a united front, but Chiang Kai-shek is in a very difficult situation uh, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, just to think, literally as soon as the Japanese were defeated, they went, They, I mean, it was like almost as soon as that threat went away, they started fighting each other. They just declared war on each other and went all out. So yeah, he it's is almost like a uh, It's almost like the Middle East today, not to go too far off track here. <laughs> it's almost like the, the Middle East today. I remember during the Obama administration when... Uh, you know, ISIS was doing its thing in Iraq and in Syria, and the Russians were involved in Syria, and then there was the Assad reg- regime in Syria, the Turks, the Israelis, uh, Hezbollah, like all these, cr- all these other like militia groups that you don't hear about on the news because they change names and people die all the time. Uh, like it is just this quagmire of competition and nominal alliances, and the U.S. is like, uh, my head is spinning. <laughs> That actually may have been worse than what was going on in 1937, but just to illustrate the point. All right. So let's actually tell the story of what happened in the first like six ish months of the second, uh, second Sino Japanese war. So we, we talked a little bit about what happened in the North. So let's talk about what happens in, on the East coast in Shanghai. So due to due to some treaty concessions and things going on, in 1937, there was already a small contingent of Japanese military in Shanghai. Shanghai was not like a like a treaty port to the Japanese in the same way that like Hong Kong or Macau were. Uh, but there was already a Japanese contingent there in Shanghai because it was a treaty port, just not to one nation. It had been for quite some time. So Chiang Kai-shek orders his troops to kind of surround the Japanese and push them out. One thing that it's important to remember during this time was the Japanese did not intend to fully take over China. Rather, they were just trying to inflict uh, enough pain on China, the KMT, etc., to get them to make further concessions. Japan was not trying to take over all and annex all of China. Well, that's one ridiculous. Everybody knew Japan was significantly smaller than China. There's no way they could have done that. So the Marco Polo bridge incident originally was just like, Hey, we're going to take Beijing and Tianjin. We're going to get some more concessions. We're going to make everybody happy and this will be over quickly. So there wasn't a ton of Japanese troops in Shanghai. There was just this defensive uh, contingent. Well, Chiang Kai-shek was like, bump that. We're going to (laughs) surround Shanghai. We're going to push the Japanese out of here. And we're going to take our country back. Well, Japan. So the standoff occurs for a month or two where 
Japan starts reinforcing its its contingency in, in Shanghai. There's like these little intermittent skirmishes. And the KMT also starts reinforcing its positions around Shanghai. Well, like, you know, all military buildups, when, uh, you know, two opposing nations like start building up troops, they don't have to be shooting at one another. It's just the likelihood of conflict is significantly higher just by putting more people there. And, you know, guess what? <laughs> Fighting breaks out. <laughs> and the Japanese ended up placing like some 200,000 troops in Shanghai. Um, they bring a whole bunch of troops along the river there, and they start a full-scale assault. They very easily take over – I say relatively easy. Um, they relatively easily take over Shanghai and kind of cut off – because Shanghai itself is kind of – is on a somewhat of a peninsula. They take that peninsula uh, that's flanked by two rivers, and, and then they kind of stop. Well – what they didn't expect was that the KMT was going to put up the resistance that they did. So there were a lot of Japanese uh, that fought um, and died for the Battle of Shanghai. Well, what that did was that really pissed off uh, some generals. Um, and this is and once they had taken Shanghai, the next big city is relatively nearby and that was the capital city of the KMT uh Nan Nanking um for pronunciation's sake Nanking Nanjing same place uh depending on how you how you pronounce it and whatnot but just because uh Iris Chang's book The Rape of Nanking is Nanking I call it Nanking anyway um so they get the the Imperial Japanese army generals get pissed and they decide, well, there's, there's Nanking. We want China to surrender so we can get these concessions. We're just going to take over Nanking. And what ensued is one of the worst atrocities ever committed by any army of all time. <laughs> uh, I already mentioned Iris Chang wrote a book called the rape of Nanking. Cause that's it. And it was, it was called that shortly after awareness occurred. Like it was, it was bad. Yeah, I read that book a couple of years ago. Um, it is not for the faint of heart. It, it's not like light reading, light historical reading. It is. She uh, she pulled a lot of her research from like actual diaries of firsthand accounts of people that were in the city when this happened, and like Westerners that tried to set up a um, like a safe zone, an international safe zone within the city, which was like this just large area. That they're like, and they had these different refugee camps, and uh, basically the the Chinese government was just like, "Hey, we're leaving. Everybody, get out of here. Get out now, or go to the safe zone." And um, they taught. I think in the book, she they estimate that like twenty to sixty thousand women were like raped, and it wasn't just like young women or anything. It was just like women in general, pregnant women. And some of the atrocities that they committed were just terrible. Um, I think they estimated up to 300,000 people died there. Um, and if you, to put in perspective, the city was only about six to 700,000 at the time. So it was like 50% of the people just died there in a matter of like six right. weeks. So terrible atrocities. And I, I definitely right. recommend that you go read the book. Um, just because it also, I think a lot of times in, at least with Western studies, we kind of tend to focus on Europe in World War II and the atrocities, mm -hmm. the Germans, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then followed by the Russians, I guess, kind of. Um, so we really overlook a lot of things like this. Like if you were to go to your average American and ask him about the rape of non King, they would have no idea what you're talking about. And it was right. brutal and bad. And actually I think the, um, the, the, the Japanese general and some of his, um, like lieutenants were, were all tried for war crimes afterward and they were executed at a military nice. tribunal. Yeah. Uh, it really is. And that's kind of one of Chang's points in her book is that is like, we don't talk about, uh, the rape of Nanking or it's also called the Nan Nanking or Nanjing massacre. Uh, cause rape is such a strong word, but, um, yeah, like we don't talk about it, and it and it all then it all goes back to when at the end of World War One or World War Two, the United States took uh, 
um, significant measures to actually not downplay, but to classify a lot of the war crimes that the Japanese had committed because we were very concerned about uh, stability in Japan. Um, We were very concerned about trying to get Japan back on its feet, uh, so to speak. This is why we left Hirohito in power. Um, You know, fun fact, Emperor Hirohito, the guy that literally was in charge of Japan during all this, Pearl Harbor, World War II, he didn't die until the 1980s. Uh, he was, he was still around. Um, as a matter of fact, his, I, I I should look this up. One of our listeners, please, please correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it was like his, I think it's his son. It's at least his descendant. He just relinquished the throne like a year or two ago. (laughs) And there's now like, we're still in the Showa, um, dynasty of japan so to speak uh so like the united states we kept the japanese version of the nuremberg trials classified and a lot of it um was not declassified until like the 70s or 80s or something like that and because of that a lot of the war crimes to include uh nanking uh we just don't we don't know about it we don't talk about it uh and it, and to uh, you know Chinese today, that's a huge issue. It's like you guys did some <laughs> disgusting stuff to our people. I think that's that's actually kind of an important point. So one of the the key takeaways you had mentioned was um, like how we have to sort of dance around these relations now, and oh, you know, yeah. kind of managing. And again, we talked about we talked about it last week, kind of too, where the U.S. is sort of like, "Hey, we got to navigate this very complex cultures." Well, now today, you've got not just China and Japan who have a very deep seated distrust and sometimes outright dislike of each other, uh, but you also mm-hmm. have like Korea and other um, Pacific nations, like in um, former French Indochina. So like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, into Indonesia and the Philippines where like the Mm -hmm. Japanese did some very bad things in some of those areas. So we've got to kind of navigate like, Hey, the Japanese are our friends now and Korea, you're also our friend. Um, Mm -hmm. and the Chinese kind of aren't and the North Koreans aren't, um, how do we, how do we manage this? Because we're also doing business with China at the same time, but we're preparing our militaries to potentially fight them and defend you. So it's this very complex situation. And like, here's just a very, very small example. Like if you remember the, um, the 2018 winter Olympics, there was, um, it was a U.S. reporter for like NBC and he, he made kind of an innocuous comment. I don't think he really honestly knew the history, but he basically said like, yeah, South Koreans really looked to Japan as an example for their economy And the South Koreans were furious about that. Like there was an uproar Hmm. and NBC had to apologize because during World War II, the Japanese soldiers would take what they call like war wives in South Korea. And it is still a, it's still a sore spot. So, you know, Hmm. 80 years later, here we are and they're still upset about it. It is still like deep seated historical trauma that they're holding against the Japanese to the point that they made this reporter who had no idea and really had no reference to it, apologize for his insensitivity. So that's just a small example of what we're kind of navigating around out there because of events yeah. like this. Yeah. Even, even today in Japan, you know, there is a conservative element and a more liberal element in the conservative old guard of Japan. Um, they like, in order to be like a card carrying member of the the right in Japan, you basically have to deny Japanese war crimes during World War II. Like it's a super sensitive topic just within internal Japanese politics. For example, uh, Shinzo Abe, who I still can't believe that dude was assassinated. Like that's just mind blowing to me. Anyway, Shinzo Abe, uh, the long, long time prime minister of Japan. He was sharply criticized. There's a particular 
World War II memorial in Japan that commemorates like the you know the dead of of Japan. And if you like if you go visit it as the prime minister, you're like you're either a boy. Uh, what I, what I mean is like on the you know from the conservative faction's point of view, it's like oh you're one of our boys because you went to this and you paid your respects. And from the liberal faction, uh, it's like you're a monster, you're a war criminal. Like that memorial symbolizes all the bad things that we done or that we did during World War II. And not just that, the Koreans get upset and the Chinese get upset if the prime minister goes and visits this memorial. It's almost like um uh. It's almost like cancel cancel culture. It's like the Japanese version of cancel culture in that if you acknowledge or don't acknowledge the war crimes in Japan, that that puts you distinctly in a camp, and you will be demonized by the other side, depending on on uh, on which camp you you fall into. There's, um, no, right, there's no way to win. Yeah, uh, another uh, thing. There's uh, there's some uh, academics in Japan who like fight with Chinese indirectly fight with Chinese academics on the exact number of people that were killed in Nanking. Like this is, this is a huge debate even today. Like in the yeah. last 20 years, there's been I didn't realize significant that. argument over this. I didn't realize that. That's a good point. I, when I was just kind of looking this up today there, and it's not like it's this kind of fringe couple people online in a chat room. It's like, there mm. are Japanese scholars who literally would say like it was impossible. It's all propaganda. It, it did, yeah. you know, this didn't come out till after the war. It was to embarrass Japan and really, you know, put it put us down. And like, there's no way if you look at you do the math, they, it couldn't have been done. This is all it was all propaganda. So yeah. it, and it, it's a it's a large sect of people in Japan mm. that that believe this. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So. Real quick, let's talk about like implications for international relations here, because one per you know one view is well, the United States needs to pressure Japan to apologize. Like this was obviously really bad, um, and the United States needs to like make Japan apologize. And this is this is a naive viewpoint. And here's why. Every country has dirty laundry. Every country has skeletons in their closet. And if we were all to try to pressure one another to feel some kind of moral uh, um, uh, repentance over past historical deeds, that's one, that's all we would ever do. And two, like we could never get along with anybody so generally speaking, as a rule, you if you're a diplomat in a foreign country, you don't talk about that country's dirty laundry. Here, here's an example. In the 80s, during the Thatcher administration, right? The conservatives in the United States and the conservatives in Great Britain were buddy buddy. You had Reagan, you had Thatcher, everything was fine between us. Well, one of the things that we don't talk about here in the United States is what the British were doing in Ireland, particularly in Northern Ireland during that time. And there was like a low key war going on <laughs> in Northern Ireland. And you had the conservative British who were literally killing Irish people and Irish people were killing British. Like it was, it was bad. It was ugly. It was and a if you go to insurgency. If you go to Belfast today, like there is a very real scar tissue uh, over what was going on. And it wasn't just the 80s, but just to give an example, like there were some questionable things that the Thatcher uh, government was doing uh, in in Northern Ireland. And the, U the U.S. wasn't saying anything because we were buddy, buddy and still remain to this day, buddy, buddy with the Brits. Conversely. The United States has its own dirty laundry. I mean, you name it, everything. I mean, slavery is in the Civil War is the big one. 
Uh, but like, even from a Japanese perspective, like during World War II in the internment camps, like we were literally rounding up Asian people because they were Asian and putting them in internment camps. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no, it's like, hey, sorry, Japan, we were also mistreating your people. And then with the Chinese, it was like, hey, by the way, we were really mistreating your people too, which was it was yeah. a sore spot for the Chinese today because they look at the U.S. and say, you really mistreated our people yeah. who were in your country. The the point being is that we all have our dirty laundry and like if the British were to come to us and say like, or no, even better, Japanese, if the Japanese were to come to us today and be like, hey, like you guys really mistreated, you know, African-Americans in slavery, we really think y'all should give them reparate, like monetary reparations in 2022, 2023. We... You know, I'm sure some Americans would be like, yeah, but then a lot of Americans would be like, you're freaking outside of your mind. Right? <laughs> and furthermore, who are you, Japan, to say that to us? So if, you know, the United States were to go like, hey, Japan, like you guys really need to apologize to the Chinese, they'd probably look at us and have the exact same reaction. It would be, who the freak are you? Well, actually, in Japan, they they they'd be like, "Oh, thank you so much for your suggestion." Like, <laughs> they'd probably be really polite about it. Now, they give them but, really polite. <laughs> no. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm sure you the right guy. You'd probably really piss him off. But the point being is, with with, with regards to U.S. and Chinese relations today, like this is a huge hurdle for third party Americans to navigate uh, this rape of Nanking and what the Japanese were doing during uh, World War II that is has very real implications for for today. All right, so anyway, let's let's bring it back. So we're, we're kind of, <laughs> let's bring it back to what was going on. Um, so the rape of Nanking happens. What happens, you know, from here on out throughout the Sino-Japanese War? All right, so you know, it's 1937 going into 1938, and essentially from here until 1941, you get increasing measures by the Roosevelt administration to alienate Japan and begin, like, you know, informally severing ties. It's important to note that this is done by the Roosevelt administration. So in 1931, I believe the Hoover administration was in office. We didn't really do much more than slap Japan on the wrist in 1931. In 1935, the Roosevelt administration was office, but we are deep in the throes of the Great Depression. There is no appetite, politically speaking, to really try to strong arm anybody. The number one priority for the Roosevelt administration is to get us out of the Great Depression. However, in 1937, we're still not quite out of the Great Depression, but things are a lot better. And the Roosevelt, or FDR in particular, he was a new breed of Democrat who was had a lot stronger appetite for interventionism. It's kind of funny because looking at the rest of the 20th century for the United States, it really was Democrats who were, you know, who leaned interventionists and Republicans have always kind of been more isolationist. You had, um, uh, you know, Kennedy and LBJ kind of getting us involved in Vietnam. Uh, um, that's just one more example. Obviously there's exceptions to the rule. Uh, Eisenhower kind of did some things prior to Kennedy. You know, the, the there were two different Taiwan Strait crises that um, Roosevelt put carriers in the Taiwan Strait. You know, you had uh, the the both Bush administrations that were doing things in, in Iraq, you know, but um, uh, so yes, like Republicans can be interventionist, but generally speaking, painting big, broad brush strokes here, uh, Republicans tend to be more isolationist. Democrats tend to be more interventionist. And a lot of that is because of FDR, as the example of FDR as a Democrat, began pushing this interventionism uh, in World War II. So one of the neat things, well, I, I don't know if neat's the right word, but one of the things uh, 
that doesn't get taught in American history textbooks is how Roosevelt simultaneously pushed these neutrality acts, uh, which was a declaration that we would not give a uh, war material, you know, either what, what we now call lethal aid, uh, like guns and, and tanks and planes and ships, uh, ammunition, uh, as opposed to what we call non-lethal aid, which could be anything from like, uh, helmets and in protection to like supplies like at this time steel or oil a lot of this stuff was big so we signed these uh neutrality acts around the same time 36 37 38 uh that basically said the united states was not going to give war material either lethal or non-lethal to a country during a state of war well Simultaneously, Roosevelt was a little bit more aggressive in trying to pressure Japan to get out of China. So what he did was he found this loophole was, oh, Japan had not declared war against China. Therefore, there is no state of war between Japan and China right now. And I can therefore do trade as usual. I'm doing air quotes. Trade as usual here during this time. And I can give the Chinese <laughs> anything that they want. That's an amazing um, loophole, by the way. Yeah, it's like they're they're not at war right now. So therefore, I'm not violating the neutrality acts. <laughs> I, I no, bring this just, up to it's a war in every sense of the word, but right. it's not on paper. There's not a legal state of war. Therefore, I'm not legally violating the neutrality acts. Um, it's really it's really funny uh, how this works out because. We're doing similar but different things in Ukraine today. Like the United States has always been an economic powerhouse. We are still the world's largest economy. China is not even close. Um, I, I love talking this because uh, I, I really do love the United States. Uh, I, I forget how many, I want to say the United States economy by measure of GDP is the same size as like the next five or six combined. <laughs> And that includes China. Like everybody freaks out about like, oh, China's this rise. Yes, they are a rising power. Like, yes, they need to, you know, we need to work well with them, et cetera. But like we forget what, how much of an economic powerhouse the United States is. And it's not even close. Number two, number two is China. Number three is Japan. I want to say number four is Germany. Uh, it, it is Germany. Yeah. Yeah, and after and after that I forget. But like we're literally bigger than all of those economies combined. <laughs> yeah. So just just to throw some some hard numbers out there, we make up about <clears throat> um about 24% of the world's economy, yeah. almost 25%. A quarter. And yeah. China is about 12%. So we're just under, you know, cuz it's like 19 trillion and then they're about 12 trillion. I think that the scary thing to your point is not so much where they're at now, but their general average GDP growth is about six six point nine percent, and ours is only about two to three. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, yeah, then it, then but it's it, like India, United Kingdom, France, and it just kind of falls off from there. Back to your point, yeah. sorry. <clears throat> and, well, even even to compare the um, the GDP growth, be like, oh, their GDP is growing at a much you know double the rate ours is. Like, yeah. But they would have to sustain that for decades to catch up with us because, you know, j just to make this super simple, this is this is not proportional, but just to illustrate the point, if the United States has $100 and earns 1% every year, we're making a buck every year, right? If, if Japan has a dollar and makes... 1% a year, they're not making a buck. They're making a cent. <laughs> it would take them a hundred years to make the same amount of money that the United States was oh, making oh, at that same time. We'll get into compound interest though. But, it, it, not a but to the point, like it is not a given that China can continue 6% growth indefinitely. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a whole lot of assumptions being made. Like one, you have to accept the 6% for, 
figure. Oh, uh, because I was going to say, you have to accept what the China, because a lot of those numbers have been hidden if you've been paying attention. And there's a lot of, right. uh, there's a lot of um, financial organizations like, um, what was that one called? Anyway, the, the CCP basically props up a lot of failing businesses. You know, we got, there's a lot of scrutiny about the big bailout that occurred in the U.S. Mm-hmm. banks. Mm-hmm. The, the CCP by policy does that to Evergrande. That's it. Evergrande right now is yeah. like defaulting. You know, they're a huge driver behind the Chinese real estate market, which is part of what is fueling their current growth. Um, and the CCP is absolutely bailing them out so they do not default anymore because they owe mm-hmm. a lot of people money, a lot of foreign countries money. And it would look very badly on the CCP if they suddenly, if everyone realized that, oh, their real estate market is so overvalued that they have fake cities or excuse me, empty cities that are only occupied yeah. by about 10% of, you know, it's only 10% occupancy. I'm getting way right. ahead of that. That's like a current state thing, but that. You're right. The assumption no, no, no. of the it's 6. the loins 9, of history. The, the <laughs> we talk about six point nine percent. It like we we go through these different things. Like that's assuming. Like I think it's twenty fifty ish that they they think that they'll pass us. But that's assuming yep. that it is continued growth and some cataclysmic event doesn't occur. Which through the loins of history, we've seen that they occur all the time. There's major setbacks and problems that occur all the time. Yeah. No. It, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I personally believe that like it it feels like 2020 was 1929 or 1930 like significant tectonic event just rocked the globe created a period of instability and like this isn't going to be over anytime soon folks the I don't I don't know what that looks like. I really hope it doesn't look like, you know, continued plagues and wars and instability. Like I would love for this to kind of just all blow over and we go back to, you know, 1991 and everything's all hunky dory, but it just, it just doesn't feel that way. Like it's not a guarantee um, that things are going to get better. Like Japan, not Japan, China is increasingly aggressive. Like if you look at uh, the the third, the, the last party Congress that occurred in October, you can draw a lot of parallels between that party Congress and the current trajectory of the CCP to Imperial Japan <laughs> during this time. Like it just looks similar. Uh, it doesn't mean that Japan or China is going to, freaking invade uh any other country besides taiwan but nevertheless like you get this trajectory of you know uh of revanchism where they feel like they have a chip on their shoulder it is not good when countries feel like they have a chip on their shoulder and japan had a chip on their shoulder during this time china has a chip on their shoulder at this time russia's got a huge chip on their shoulder (laughs) at this time uh Whereas Germany had a chip on their shoulder in World War II. So, like, it's just not a good look. And, uh, yeah, things – I don't know what the future holds, but we have to learn what happened in this time to try to make sure that it doesn't happen I think again that's a, for sure. I really think that was a good point to bring up that, like, 2020 – like it was, it was very different. It, it's different causes, obviously, different symptoms, d- some different effects immediately after. But you're right. There are some tectonic shifts that create instability. And the thing about instability, and it creates a vacuum. Power hates a vacuum. In geopolitics, something is going to fill that void. And it's going to be interesting to see, you know, there's the the BR, what is it, the BRICS payment system that's being formed. Kind of a, almost like a new axis in this, you know, for a long time, the U.S. has enjoyed this sheer hegemony over the rest of the world. And that's kind of going away with BRICS because it's like the Russians, the Chinese, and a lot of other countries are sort of teaming up to say, well, the thing that you have, the most power you have in your economy, we're going to try and take away as much as we can and build our own. So it's this sort of multipolar state. It's, it's almost creating like a kind of a second Cold War type of feel. That's, that's sort of how I see it. It's like we may not go into a world war, but 
we're definitely going to have this. There's China, Russia over here. There's the U S and its allies over here. And like, we may not, you know, tensions are going to be high between the two of us. And there's going to be a lot of little proxy wars like Ukraine being fought all over the place, potentially, but who knows? We'll see. So no, listening to you talk like, yeah, we, there's no telling what's, what it's going to look like in the future. It could be a major conventional war, like, you know, maybe not world war two. Cause that was world war two is just massive studying all of global history for 2000 years. Like world war two was like off the charts. So the likelihood of something like world war two happening again, I would consider it low. But that doesn't mean that there won't be like more localized conflicts where a lot of people die. The a, a lot of times, and this is, I guess, what I'm. I want to distinguish ourselves from some of the doom and gloom that the media loves reporting now, because the media likes reporting doom and gloom, bec- and they like fear mongering for fear mongering's own sake, because that's what gets people to pay attention, right? It's profitable. But, Right. This is the loins of history. All right. We, I'm, I do not want to fear monger for the sake of fear mongering. Rather, I, as a matter of fact, the whole reason why this podcast exists uh, is so that we learn so that we can prevent the bad things from happening. You know, for example, right now, I think I can safely say the US and China is our current trajectory is conflict. And I mean like bullets flying. It's just like, this is, this is how history works, folks. Like you, you have two major powers that are beefing over issues. There is no, uh, resol obvious resolution in sight. China as the, you know, quote unquote underdog in this scenario, like they have something to prove. Like I said, they have a chip on their shoulder, the United States is not in a position where it's going to back down. Like I'm, we are on the path to conflict. I do not want that to happen because people die. I mean, look, we we didn't talk about this, uh, and we're running out of time. But like, in an effort to stop the Japanese invasion, the Chinese like busted the the dikes that were that hold the Yellow River in, and for all of you know the millennia of Chinese history. Uh, the, the yellow river flooding, like kills hundreds of thousands of people. And I was reading when they, when the, that when the Chinese the, blew the dikes, go ahead, huh? yeah, keep going. I was going to say it happened when, during the, when the Chinese rebellion. blew the dikes that the yellow river flooded. Yeah. Well, when they, when they blew the dikes in the second Sino Japanese war, like some 200,000 people died, like Chinese people died, not not Japanese. We're not talking about you know God and Moses parting the Red Sea and, <laughs> and the Egyptians walking into it and like everybody's fine and only the Egyptians died. That's not what happened. It was we have to flood the Yellow River to prevent the Japanese from coming any further, and they killed two hundred thousand of their own people. Another another example, just to illustrate the point here, uh, during the Korean War when the North Koreans invaded. Uh, Seoul is north of the major river. I cannot remember off the top of my head the name of this river. Somebody tell me, but um, in the comments. <laughs> but the U.S. military was there, uh, and you have tons of refugees f- trying to get south, trying to escape from the North Korean onslaught. And there was like some, I want to say it was some U.S. Army like major or maybe – Maybe he's like a lieutenant colonel or colonel. I forget, but like he literally like uh, uh, had his thumb on the dynamite to blow all the bridges to stop the North Koreans. And their S- uh, T.R. Fehrenbach's This Kind of War is the best book on the Korean War. And he talks about this. One reason why I love Fehrenbach's book is he's angry the whole, bu- the whole book. It's just he's angry. He's definitely grinding an axe and I love it. Anyway. This U.S. Army guy had to blow the bridges at at a certain time, and those bridges were chocked full of Korean civilians. Estimated some 10,000 Koreans died on the bridge. Not like they got stuck in Seoul. Just some 10,000 human beings 
made in the image of God, died, exploded, drowned, were torn to bits through flame and concussion. Like you, like folks, war sucks. War is not good. And we have got to learn these lessons so that this stuff doesn't happen. So like the fear mongering is not like, listen more to the learns of history. The fear mongering is, is like, we desperately need good people to figure it out and stop this nonsense. That's anyway, sorry. That's is my it, rant. Is no, it I'm the done. Han River? <laughs> First off, that was a great rant. I'm going to say that was a great rant. Very powerful. Is it the Han River you're talking about that kind of divides? That sounds right. Yeah. I, I that think sounds it's the right. Han River. Um, I think one of the telltale signs of a coming conflict is where countries start to insulate themselves from being isolated. And what I mean by that is if you remember the Japanese were getting some like 80% of their oil from the U S and when they, you know, when Roosevelt Mm -hmm. cut ties, they were like, okay, we're going to go get oil from somewhere else. Like they were basically like, okay, if we do this, the U S cuts this off from us. We've got to go find it elsewhere. And we're going to do that. And we're, we have plans to do that. It's kind of like now with the U S and the Chinese, it's like the U S is like, well, if we lose Taiwan, the semiconductor industry, which is where we have computers, everything we, we thrive on now in our modern economy is built. We need to invest in making it here in the U S we need to bring the supply chain back to the U S whereas the Chinese are mm-hmm. like, Hey, we need to figure out how to buy oil, not in dollars. Hey, we need a payment mm-hmm. system, not in dollars, because if the event happens where we go to war, we don't want to be cut off. And you can kind of see, if you read the signs, you're like, okay, well, the Germans and the Japanese started doing these things where they were isolating themselves and mm-hmm. pulling themselves away from the international community. Kind of, That's kind of like a telegraph or, you know, they're telegraphing what they're going to do. Looking back, okay, the Japanese knew they're going to lose oil. They they have plans to go get it somewhere else right now. Yep. You know, just I'm just I'm looking at the rhymes. It doesn't repeat, but it yep. rhymes. Right. Yeah. Nations begin hardening their economies when they believe conflict is inevitable. Either they think they're going to get attacked, or they plan on attacking somebody else. Um. Uh. Yeah. And. Oil, oil production, just like World War II, then and now, is a huge, you know, aspect to to this kind of stuff. And China is just as concerned about oil as Japan was uh, in World War II. And on that note, just to try to wrap it up here, though, because I want to, I want to try to get us to 1941. <laughs> Long story short, is the Roosevelt administration begins. Uh, giving foreign aid. It wasn't called Lend-Lease at this at this time because the Lend-Lease Act doesn't get passed until 1941, but we were giving material aid uh, to the Chinese and we were cutting off the Japanese. The final straw, so the Japanese invade, they take over a whole bunch of different ports. The final straw for the United States was in 1940, you know, World, so World War II from a European perspective kicks off in 1939 in September with the Nazi invasion of Poland. Great Britain, France, Germany, Poland all declare war on one another. Uh, and um, in 1940, that's the fall of France and you now have Vichy France in the free French government. Well, Indochina was nominally still controlled by Vichy France, Indochina being now the countries of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, all controlled by France. Vichy France, you know, by being a puppet government of the Nazis is now friendly with the Japanese and the Japanese make an offer and say, Hey, we want to take over, um, first Northern Indochina and then later all of Indochina. The U S government, the Roosevelt administration saw these advances as just further Japanese aggression. Uh, they saw the Japanese getting closer and closer to Guam, closer and closer to the Philippines. And Roosevelt was like, that's it. Final straw. So when the, when the Japanese move into Indochina, um, Roosevelt signs an executive order that essentially freezes all Japanese assets in the United States. This is the de facto oil embargo <clears throat> that that people talk about. If if Japan can't like make any purchases uh, because all your money is frozen in 
in U.S. banks in the United States, uh, you can't buy any oil from American businesses, and therefore you've been embargoed. Uh, and he did this via executive order. So that happened, I believe, in July of 1941. That was the final straw. That was when um, I'm pretty sure I'd have to read uh, At Dawn We Slept Again. Uh, <laughs> but the Japanese planning to attack Pearl Harbor actually occurred before this, uh, like a few months prior to. The, you know, that's when Yamamoto was making his plans to to do Pearl Harbor. Uh, we could do a whole episode on Yamamoto, by the way. That dude's a fascinating character. Um very familiar with the United States, actually educa- partially educated in the United States, knew exactly what he was getting himself into. He was the main architect behind Pearl Harbor, even though he's kind of seen as this noble villain by the United States, uh, generally admired by uh, Americans, even though he's literally the reason why, we, why Pearl Harbor happened. Um, and you know, this oil embargo was like, all right, that's it. We have to... If we can't get oil from the United States, we have to get oil elsewhere. The closest place for oil is uh, the Dutch and British uh, colonies in Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Um, also significant amounts of rubber there. Um, And in order to successfully take over that, we need to do preemptive strikes against the Philippines, um, Guam, Wake Island, uh, and Pearl Harbor. So that gets us to 1941, the United States. I th- and I think it's important, especially for all of our American listeners to understand, like kind of, and kind of trying to bring this full circle. The whole reason why Japan attacked Pearl Harbor was because of China. Like we, the United States had been doing more in- increasing aggressive measures trying to get Japan to pull out of China. Japan couldn't do that from their perspective. So they're like, it's inevitable. We have to go to war with the United States and we have to, it was just one more fallacy of like, we have to end this war quickly type deal. Uh, By the way, military folks, just fun fact. If you ever think to yourself, whether you're Russian, American, you name it, if you ever think to yourself, we can end this war quickly. You cannot end this war quickly. The war will be over by Christmas. <laughs> the war will not be over by Christmas. <laughs> you're you're going to get yourself into more trouble than you originally planned. You are not that good. Uh, the war will not. Even the Germans, people like people are like, well, the Germans defeated the Poles and the in the French. It's like, yeah, and they got them like they lost. They got they lost. themselves World into War t- quite the quagmire. Not they even got World themselves World War One. They're like the Shalifa yeah. plan. We have six. I think they said they're like we have six weeks or like seventy two days. I can't remember exactly how it was, but like they had this timeline. They're like, if we miss this by a day, we will yeah. lose. Like it'll yeah. it'll turn into this. <laughs> it'll turn into this. It'll turn into this quagmire. Sorry, sorry, folks. We have kids. <laughs> It's fine. It'll turn into it'll turn into a quagmire, and we will lose. Like even they were like, we have. I think the Japanese kind of had the same mentality. They're like, we have to strike now, strike hard. We have to yes, win it immediately. They- Otherwise, we it'll it'll turn into this long drawn out war, and we will lose if it's drawn out. For every example of a war ending quickly, there are ten other examples where wars did not end quickly. <laughs> yeah. You know, I anyway, think puts the I think that puts the U.S. kind of at least like from a public perception kind of thing. Like we always think desert storm, like a hundred hours of conflict, 100 hours of conflict is an aberration. Like that doesn't happen. And, well, and I don't think and, it would happen. No. So yes, the conventional aspect, a hundred hours of conflict, but would 2003 have occurred if 1991 or 1990 hadn't occurred? If we we also forget. Job. We also forget. Somebody was telling me about out. I think it was Outcast or maybe Andre Three Thousand uh, um, wrote a song called "Bombs Over Baghdad" in the nineties. Great, uh, great song. Or, or maybe it was in the eighties. I forget. Anyway, we were we still bombed Iraq after um, Desert Storm because we were trying to protect the um, Kurds. Uh, so it's like. 
Yeah, 100 Hours of Conflict. It, it, was, in but two, it was in 2000. In 2000 when we bombed? Uh, no, 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 that's when the song came out. Oh, yeah, because prior to that, probably in the 90s, we were still bombing Iraq before 2003. Like, like yeah, Desert Storm was this quick, like very decisive, quote unquote, victory. But how much of a victory was it? Like, we again, were there in th- we were there in less than 15 years. Yeah, for, and, and we're still... Th- we're still there. Yeah, we're and then we have to we're still there. It. It, yeah, still there. We're st- we're still there. We still we still very much care about what's going on in Baghdad right now. Um Yeah, it's wars do not end quickly. Uh Heck, when World War 1 ended, it did not end. <laughs> if you want to if you want to draw the the continuity between uh World War 1 and World War 2. The Peloponnesian War. Oh man, I love all these different cross references. If you read Thucydides' oh, history of the Peloponnesian War, there were technically two different wars with a with a Sicilian expedition in between. And I think Thucydides was right to kind of draw them all together into one single conflict because there was a continuity. Even though I forget how many, it's like four or five years where the Spartans and the Athenians technically weren't at war with one another in the middle, like. Wars do not end quickly, folks. Nor do they generally end well. If you the Peloponnesian reference, what happened? Ath- Athens lost its money and its navy. Sparta was drained of its resources, and then they were taken over mm-hmm. shortly thereafter by the Macedonians. That's right. Uh, Oof, we are, yeah, and the uh, and the Thebians somewhat before that. Um, inter- interesting that we've drawn parallels to the Peloponnesian War and the Second Sino-Japanese War. Yeah. We didn't even mention Ukraine, Russian Ukraine right now. <laughs> it's just so much, so much. Uh, all right, just so to recap before we close out here, continuing uh, U.S.-Chinese relations, huge shift occurs in 1937. The United States, we've been we've been talking. The open door policy went from all talk to starting to have tangible measures under the Roosevelt administration to really back up the open door policy. And that ultimately led us to Pearl Harbor in, in 1941. The, Japan attacked the United States because of Japan, or because of the United States trying to defend China um, uh, starting in 1937. So if for our, for our next episode, uh, we're going to, we're going to continue the thread. We're going to continue talking about world war two. We're going to continue talking about how the communists, uh, were involved in the beef between Mao and Chiang Kai-shek and how they're still um, fighting with one another even during World War II. So, uh, I'm yeah, definitely looking be... forward to talking about like the, they call it like the CBI, the China, Burma, India kind of front mm. of World War II. Yeah. I feel like that's, it's very overlooked. Um, you know, we always think of the island hopping and fighting the Japanese, but there was conflict that occurred in uh, China, Burma, and India and if you've ever seen the movie The Bridge Over the River, the Bridge Over the River mm. Kwai, um, great movie. Yep. But you know, it, it's a whole front of that campaign and that that theater of conflict that we don't talk about a lot. And I think we're gonna we're gonna bring a lot of that in. Yeah, it's the Pacific theater in World War II is fascinating. Um, World War II is there's just so much. Love World War II. We'll, we'll try and get some of it next week. But. Uh, yeah, Jay, thanks for that summary and thanks for taking us through this episode. Yeah, folks, if you like if you like what we're doing here at the Lawrence of History, you're enjoying uh, what we're talking about. We love getting feedback. We love hearing from our, our, our fans, our listeners, any constructive or not so constructive feedback if you have it. We love to hear it. So please follow us on social media. Reach out to us that way. We like interacting with anybody that um, listens to us. And if you do also enjoy it, give us a five-star rating on whether you're listening on Spotify, Apple uh, Podcasts, or Podcast Addict. Uh, We love that. It helps us get the word out. It really uh, alters the algorithm and moves us to the front of the line, top of the queue, if you will. So appreciate it. Thank you for listening and hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next week.